If you're planning a trip to Japan, you're most certainly looking to spend at least a few nights in Kyoto. My partner and I went for the first time back in late September, early October, and learned a ton of lessons from our time there. So I thought I'd share them with you so you're clued up and ready for your trip. Oh, and if you somehow weren't thinking of going to Kyoto and are watching this video, I hope this convinces you otherwise, because you should absolutely visit Kyoto. In case you missed it, I did an entire video covering Kyoto's neighbor, Osaka. Watch it to find out why you should go there. The two cities are located just 35 miles from each other, which means about a 15 minute ride on the Shinkansen, the bullet train, or about an hour on a more regular train or metro. There's no airport in Kyoto, so the quickest way you can get there is by flying into Osaka airport and getting the train. You can also get to Kyoto in a couple hours from Tokyo on the Shinkansen too. We stayed at the Hotel Rezo Shijo that has awesome metro and bus travel links. A bunch of the coolest things to see were easily accessible from our hotel, like the Fushimi Inari Taisha with its famous path of Tori gates, the Kiyomizu Dera that provides amazing views of the entire city, the Golden Temple, Bamboo Grove and Kyoto Tower. We also visited neighboring cities Yuji and Nara on our trip, and I highly recommend you do as well as they're very close and accessible from Kyoto. We'd highly recommend the Hotel Rezo Shijo as a place to stay in Kyoto. The room was small, but had a cozy, traditional feel with its tatami floor and wooden furniture. Just like most Japanese hotels, you get free pajamas, amazing in-person service, all the free amenities you can think of, and a washing machine room to clean your clothes. Kyoto is the mecca of Japanese culture and you get a feeling of tradition everywhere, even on its older style metro trains with a wooden interior. In Osaka, I exclusively use the metro to get everywhere, but in Kyoto it's not quite as clear cut. You'll be getting on a bunch more buses. They'll either get you to your destination quicker or you'll have to use them because there's no metro alternative. The good news is buses in Japan are basically always perfectly on time and come extremely frequently. The Fushimi Inari Taisha is easily one of Kyoto's most famous shrines. There's roughly 10,000 red tori gates that guide you up Mount Inari. Each has been donated by a company or individual and is marked with their name. If you're visiting, you probably want a trademark shot of the tori gates looking empty. Pro tip, don't try this at the base of the shrine where it's extremely busy. Just keep following the path up and you'll see it get quieter. Then you'll be able to get shots like this. You can get your own little red tori gate to take home, or perhaps you want to donate your own proper tori gate to the shrine. If you do, they start at around 400,000 yen or just over 2,000 pounds. Once you're at the top of the shrine, you can pray to Inari, the god of rice, success in business, and fortune. Getting to the top took us about an hour and a half. You don't get a view at the top, which was a little disappointing, but you do get this incredible view of Kyoto about three quarters of the way up. Then, when you've got back down, you can treat yourself to one of the many food stands set up. Like one of these crab and fish sticks. Trust me, you'll have earned it. A 40 minute or so ride on public transport from the Inari Shrine takes you to the Kiyomizu Dera Temple. It was first built in the year 778, but much of what you see today are reconstructions from 1633. The temple is most famous for its huge wooden terrace that sits about 30 meters above ground that offers incredible views of Kyoto. The temple has huge grounds that are great for having a wander. There's tons of other shrines and spots with amazing views to explore. Just like most of the big tourist spots in Kyoto expect huge crowds, and I mean absolutely huge. I definitely recommend starting your days as early as possible to try and have at least part of your day where you're not packed in with hundreds of others. The Kinkakuji Temple's history dates back as far as 1397, but what you're looking at isn't the original but rather a reconstruction from 1955 that was built after an earlier version of the pavilion was burned down. The word Kinkaku means gold pavilion. That's because the first and second story are covered in gold leaf, which is gold that has been hammered into a thin sheet. The building itself is pretty incredible to see and there's also some beautiful grounds to explore too. A 20 minute walk away is the Roanji Temple, or the Temple of the Dragon at Peace. 
This is a Zen temple that dates back to the 15th century and has some pretty incredible grounds and buildings to explore too. It's also home to Japan's most famous rock garden. This features larger rocks amongst a sea of raked, smooth pebbles. The idea is to create a peaceful environment that stimulates meditation. I'm no expert, but after sitting in the gardens for 20 or so minutes, I certainly felt calmer, more relaxed, and mindful. Kyoto Tower stands out amongst a sea of much smaller, more traditional buildings. It's made of steel, is 430 feet tall, and is located in pretty much the center of the city, right opposite Kyoto Station. You get amazing views of the entire city, and it's the only place you can see some of its most famous landmarks from above. Definitely visit during the day though, as much of the city isn't lit up at night. You can get some pretty incredible images from the tower. That's Osaka over there in the distance, by the way. Next up is Kyoto's geisha district, Gion. One of the first things you should do there is visit Yasaka Shrine, which was constructed back in the year 656. There's all the usual shrine things to do here, and we found it looked absolutely stunning at night with its copious paper lanterns lit up. A 10 minute walk from the shrine is arguably Kyoto's most famous photo spot, Hokanji Temple. There's something so special about the five story pagoda and traditional street combination that's so very photogenic. Just know it's nigh on impossible to get a photo without anyone in it though. There's tons of other cool places nearby too, like this, the Yasaka Koshindu Temple, where people write their wishes on colorful cloth balls and stick them across the grounds. Gion has good food in abundance. We got a couple sweet treats down Shijo Street, one of the main streets in Kyoto that runs from the entire east to west of the city. Here we bought taiyaki, which is a fish-shaped cake filled with red bean paste and is absolutely delicious. Next up, we went to a shop, still on Shijo Street, called Kagizen Yoshifusa that sells all kinds of Japanese sweets. Seriously, there's tons of stuff to try here. Like most food in Japan, I really encourage you to try things that take your interest. Nine times out of ten, you'll be pleasantly surprised. But this isn't just a store to pick up and go. It has an entire restaurant area at the back where you can enjoy tea and other confections. My partner and I tried kuzukiri, which is a Japanese dessert that's essentially noodles you dip into sugar syrup. It was extremely tasty, but we should have shared a single order as the portion size here is huge. We also had warabimochi, which is a jelly-like food that's covered in a flavor of your choice. We chose brown sugar, which really hit the spot. The Arashiyama Bamboo Forest is located in Kyoto's northwest and is an absolute must-see. However, just a word of warning, the bamboo grove isn't as huge as pictures make it out to be. Unless my partner and I missed a trick somewhere, this is something you can easily do in less than 45 minutes. But while it's smaller than we thought, it is beautiful, and we had a great time walking through it, along with about a thousand others early in the morning. Luckily, once you've made the trip to the bamboo grove, there's a ton of other things to do that are literally on its doorstep, like visiting the Tenjuji Temple. I'll be honest, temple and shrine fatigue in Kyoto is a real thing. With that said, each is brimming with culture and there are always beautiful grounds to explore. We were also lucky to have perfect weather well into October for all our exploring. And hey, if you need a break from trekking around, the temple has an area where you can relax on some traditional tatami mats. After visiting the temple, we went for a stroll along the Katsura River, which flows from the mountains all the way through Kyoto City. It's a nice, peaceful walk that I highly recommend. There are also boats you can hire if you want to see more of the river and its surroundings. Or, if you don't fancy a boat, how about a rickshaw ride? I also want to shout out a restaurant called Arashiyama Curry, which did amazing food and is only a short walk from the river.
One of the train stations closest to the bamboo forest and Tenruji Temple is called Saga Arashiyama Station. Next to it is another, smaller station called Saga Toroko Station, which is most famous for running the Sagano Romantic Train. This is an older style locomotive that follows a 25 minute route along the Hozukyo Valley, where you'll get some amazing views. Pro tip, if you want to ride the train, it's best to go to the station as soon as you arrive in the area and buy a ticket with a reserve time, as it can get quite busy. Oh, it's also worth noting the line doesn't run in the winter, which is from the end of December to the end of February. It's really exciting to see the train pull up in the station and climb aboard. The passenger carriages have a roof which will protect you if the weather isn't great, and open sides so you get an uninterrupted view and for taking pictures. And the views you get are spectacular. Lush green forest as far as you can see and a beautiful river in the middle with boats making their way downstream. I will say though that the journey does get a little tiresome towards the end. The seating gets uncomfortable as you're only sitting on a wooden chair with no cushioning. And more importantly, the train is incredibly loud, even more so when you go through tunnels which you'll do a fair bit on the route. We rode the train back and forth, which was certainly a mistake as about halfway through the journey back, we were very eager to get off. Instead, I recommend getting off at the end stop, Kamioka Taroko Station, and then returning via a boat down the river. In fact, there are actually shuttle buses that operate from the station to take you to boat departures, so it's incredibly easy. Yes, Kyoto Station is a key transport hub in the city, but it's also an attraction in its own right. There are tons of shops, places to eat, and more under its 15-storey roof. A few things worth seeing include the staircase that leads to the roof. There's 171 steps in total, and 125 of those feature approximately 15,000 LEDs that illuminate with incredible designs. The stairs light up from 3pm to 10pm, and on the station's website there's even a page that shows you what performances are currently being played. There's also a skyway which gives you great views of station goers down below and an incredible view of Kyoto Tower, which is just opposite the station, as well as the rest of the city. The skyway is located on the 11th floor alongside a bunch of great restaurants. Our personal favourite was the Sky Garden on the roof that also gives you a great view of Kyoto Tower, without any glass in your way this time, and the rest of the city. It's also a great place to relax and watch the world go by after a busy day of sightseeing. The best meal my partner and I had throughout our entire stay in Japan was in Kyoto Station at a restaurant called Jojo N. It's located on the seventh floor and is most famous for its huge selection of Wagyu beef that you cook yourself on a barbecue griller in your table. But before we get to the food, ladies and gentlemen, I need to call out the incredible service and overall above and beyond nature of Jojo N. The dining area was spotless and many of the tables in the Kyoto restaurant are located by huge windows that give you an amazing view of Kyoto Tower. Food time. Now, I'm no chef nor food critic, but this is easily some of the best beef I've ever tasted. We ordered a bunch of varieties including steaks and beef tongue, all of it was absolutely delicious. You're probably thinking all of this is pretty expensive, and you'd be half right. Yes, this was the most expensive meal we had in Japan, coming in at about £100 in total. But, for us at least, coming from London, that was a steal for the quality of the food, service and overall experience. I also want to call out the water light show outside Kyoto Station that's definitely worth checking out. For us, the water was dancing to the Beatles' All You Need Is Love. And then, on the way back to our hotel, our train had a mini gallery on it featuring fans with designs related to each of the four seasons. This is another one of the many small little incredible touches that, for me, makes Japan so special. Yuji is a city located a stone's throw away from the south of Kyoto. It only takes about half an hour to get there from Kyoto Station. Yuji is most famous for being the home of green tea, or matcha, and you'll see that immediately from the tea caddy outside its main station and the tea leaves on its drain covers. 
Yuji also has what is undoubtedly the nicest Starbucks I've ever seen. It's immediately caught my eye for its mini dry garden out front. It's located just down the road from Byodo in Temple, which we'll get to in a second. Inside are huge windows that reveal a pretty awesome Zen garden out the back where you're free to sit and enjoy your beverage of choice. It might sound strange to call Starbucks beautiful, but this one really was. Byodo in Temple is one of Yuji's most famous historic sites. Just like a bunch of popular spots in Kyoto, the temple was packed even in the early hours of the day, not only the tourists, but with students on a school trip too. The focal point of the temple's beautiful grounds is the Phoenix Hall, which consists of a main hall and two corridors on either side. It was completed in 1053 with a full-scale renovation taking place just over 600 years later. The building is shown on the 10 yen coin, with this type being in circulation since it was first produced in 1959. There's plenty more to see on the grounds, like a full museum and the Jodo in Temple you see here. It's not just the 10 yen coin that features parts of Byodo in Temple. The 10,000 yen note also features a phoenix that's the same as the two sitting on top of the Phoenix Hall's roof. There's loads more to see in Yuji. We also stumbled upon a statue of Murasaki Shikibu, who's hailed as the author of one of Japan's first novels, the last chapters of which are set in Yuji. We also had a stroll along the Yuji River, which runs through the centre of the city. You can also walk over the river via Yuji Bridge, which is thought to be one of the oldest bridges in Japan. There are tons of matcha shops in Yuji. Now, I'm no matcha connoisseur, but my partner drinks matcha daily, and for her, there were two shops we visited that really stood out, the first of which was called Hori Sishimeyen. This is a shop that not only sells tons of varieties of matcha, but actually makes all the matcha itself, from growing it on a plantation to grounding the tencha leaves, from which matcha is made, into a powder. The shop was also run by a family who were all super nice and gave great service. Most importantly though, the matcha here tastes incredible. Take my partner's word for it. The second was called Nakamura Tokichi Honten, which, just like the first, was founded back in the 1800s. And while the first specialised in matcha tea, from powder to tea leaves, this one does matcha everything. Matcha gato, cookie sandwiches, cakes, chocolate, and matcha flavoured Japanese sweets like dango, which is essentially dumplings on a stick made from rice flour. There's a huge variety which, if you're like my partner, will be a matcha lover's dream. They also sell a wide range of Japanese teas too, and you're able to taste before you buy, which is a nice touch. There's a cafe out back which reopened in 2021 for the first time in 20 years. It's very popular though, so if you want to go, I'd advise getting your ticket to wait as early as possible. There's tons of matcha and non-matcha items on the menu. I went for the seasonal parfait, which was layered with mochi, sweet potato, chestnuts, and more. It was delicious, as was the iced matcha I went for, and I don't usually care much for matcha. Nara is further south of Yuji, but you can still get there in less than an hour from Kyoto. There's actually a dedicated Nara line that runs from Kyoto to Nara, with a stop at Yuji too. Fun fact, Nara used to be the capital of Japan from 710 to 794, before the capital was moved to Kyoto. But you'll probably be more familiar with it as the place in Japan where deer roam and you're able to feed them with rice crackers. If you do decide to feed them, just make sure to remain calm, authoritative and try to buy crackers where there aren't too many deer to avoid getting immediately surrounded. Also remember that these are wild deer, so they can bite or barge you. A couple tips, don't tease the deer with food and make sure to hold your hands up when you've run out of crackers so they know you don't have any more for them. We visited both Yuji and Nara in a single day, which I wouldn't recommend as it felt a bit rushed. Yuji can definitely be done in a day, but I did feel like I missed out on a bunch of stuff in Nara. Nara Park, which you see here, is where you'll find many of the over 1,200 deer roaming around. The park was established in 1880 and is one of the oldest parks in Japan. On its grounds, that are about 1,600 acres, you'll find the Todaiji and Kofukuji temples, as well as the Kasuga Grand Shrine and Nara National Museum. The park is great for having a wander, especially if you have great weather like we did. It's all incredibly beautiful. 
The first place we visited was Todaiji Temple, which is a Buddhist temple that's absolutely huge. It was originally founded in the year 738, but like most spots you'll see in Japan with a ton of history, has had many reconstructions since then. Inside you'll find the world's largest bronze statue of Buddha Virakana, which is what you see here. You'll also see statues of Japanese guardians like Komakuten that have incredible levels of detail. When we were there, you could also personalize your own roof tile plate for the temple when repairs take place. Who doesn't want their name on a temple with over a thousand years of history? As a fun little activity, you can also try and climb through one of the pillars within the temple. It's said that those who squeeze through will be granted good health and protection from bad luck. It would be rude not to give it a go, right? As you walk further into the park, you'll notice the huge crowds of tourists start to disperse. We continued to walk through the park and came across a couple other points of interest I want to highlight, like the Todai D Shoro bell tower that was built between 1207 and 1210. The bell you see apparently weighs a whopping 26.3 tons. We also visited the Nagatsudo Hall, which requires a bit of a climb up a hill and some stairs, but the view you get of the city of Nara and beyond is well worth it. Next up, we're going on a day trip to Hiroshima for our next travel guide, so make sure to subscribe with notifications so you know when that drops. And please, if you enjoyed this video, give it a like as it really does help boost visibility of this channel's content. Thanks for watching and see you next time.